Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Amir. I'll we'll be talking about lower bounds and obfuscation from all or nothing encryption. And I'll define what it means uh, to have all or nothing encryption later during the talk. Uh, this is joint work with Sanjam Garg and Mohammed Mahmoudi. So let's define again what indistinguishability obfuscation is, or I.O. It was uh, first proposed by Barack Atal in 2001 and basically says that it's an algorithm that takes as input a circuit and outputs a functionally equivalent circuit. And for security, we say that for any two functionally equivalent circuits of the same size, an adversary shouldn't be able to distinguish between the obfuscation of one or the other. And following the, uh, the first candidate construction of Gargatal in 2013, I.O. has shown to be a quite powerful force, allowing uh, many applications to be built upon it, including functional encryption, uh, two-round uh, uh, two multi-party computation, and even proving the hardness of complexity results. And there are many more applications following that. So given the usefulness of I.O., uh, one natural question to ask is, what assumptions could give us I.O.? And to answer this question, uh, so we have two uh, main ways to get I.O. at the moment that we know of. The first being for multilinear maps. And uh, this was initiated by Gargatal in 2013. And a series of works have uh, followed this approach, uh, showing either an improved constructions or weakened, form, uh, weakened assumptions. And the alternative way to get to I.O. is through some form of functional encryption from which all constructions of this kind of functional encryption also are built, uh, uh, all known constructions also are built using the multilinear maps as well. And as you've seen from the previous talk by Rachel, the uh, state of the art of uh, constructing I.O. for functional encryption uh, happens uh, to be based on uh, trilinear maps and uh, PRGs with some uh, special properties. And their construction is non-black box. However, uh, due to certain like, due to uh, certain attacks against the instantiated multilinear maps, we are having now less confidence in the uh, security of the I/O of the security of the known constructions of I/O, and so this motivates us to uh, ask whether there can be any other alternative, uh, preferably standard assumptions that could give us I/O instead of using the more exotic multilinear map assumptions. And to answer this question, a series have works. A series of works have shown that none of these primitives give us I.O. in a black box way. This includes collision-resistant hash functions, trapdoor permutations, and even a degenerate group model. Anything that is hard in generic group model cannot give us I.O. in a black box way. But this still leaves the possibility of whether there are more, uh, uh, if there are more sophisticated primitives or perhaps stronger assumptions that could give us I.O. And in this work, we extend this line of research by showing that under mild assumptions, where mild assumptions that we make is basically that one-way function exists and that the polynomial hierarchy does not collapse, that there is no black box construction of I.O. from any of these primitives. And the kind of non-black box techniques that we rule out are uh, uh, especially relevant in this context uh, when we deal with these kind of primitives. And this is where the title of the uh, talk uh, becomes relevant, is that all of these primitives are of all or nothing nature. Meaning that if you have the decryption key, then you could decrypt the, the ciphertext and get back the entire plaintext. Otherwise, if you don't have the decryption key, you learn nothing. And so the plan for the rest of the talk is that first I will describe uh, the black box model and our proposed monolithic model, which captures uh, the non-black box techniques that uh, may be used to construct I.O. from the primitives that we will separate it from. And the second part of the talk is I will describe the high-level ideas behind our separation results and uh, 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 leverage the all-or-nothing property of the primitives that I, that I mentioned before. So let's go over the, the first part here. So in the classical black box framework of Mpagalazi Rudish and uh, Reingold, Previs, and Vatan, uh, black box construction of I.O. from P basically means that I.O. uses P in a black box way. It only uses the input-output behavior of P. And this is natural when P happens to be the one-way function in a trapdoor permutation. However, this is not the case when we deal with more sophisticated primitives or non-black box techniques. For example, one common non-black box technique involves doing some form of computation or work that could have circuits with one-way function gates inside them. Uh, this, this behavior is, is observed, for example, in the case where we could have zero-knowledge proof over circuits with one-way function calls. 
in order to uh, realize identification schemes. Another example which is relevant to uh, this session is I.O. over circuits with one-way function calls could result in many applications, some of which are represented in the Sahai and Waters uh, paper. So there are also previous works that tried to prove limits of this kind of technique. This technique where a construction Q is based on a construction P that accepts circuits the, with, uh, with one-way function gates. And here are so just some of the works that, uh, uh, that, that prove limitations of this kind of technique, starting with the work of Berkersky, uh, uh, Katz, uh, Segev, and Yurikimovich, where they show that key agreement protocols cannot be based in a black box way from witness indistinguishable proofs uh, for statements with only function gates. Also, to show the limits of I.O., Asharov and Segev shows, shows that you cannot get collision-resistant hash functions or one-way permutations from I.O. Uh, for circuits with one-way function gates. And as you'll see in the next talk, they, uh, the, uh, by the work by Britansky et al., they will show that I.O. for, for Oracle-aided circuits that could have one-way function gates inside them uh, do not imply structured hard problems in, say, NP intersect co-NP. But what about the FE to I.O. construction due to Anant Jain and uh, Britansky Vikant uh, Does this construction fall under the model where, F, where the I.O. uses the underlying FE by providing it with circuits that could have one-way function gates inside them? Well, no, that's not the case. If you look back to the construction, the I.O. actually feeds the key generation uh, function of FE a circuit that contains encryption gates of the FE. So in some way, you can think of as FE as being used in a self-eating way. FE, FE subroutines are being fed back to FE. And this is different from the functional FE for circuits with one-way function gates. This does not fit the previous models. And, uh, and there, this, is not a, this is not an uncommon behavior. There are other examples that do not fall under the circuits with one-way function gates model. For example, one famous example is the FHE bootstrapping by Gentry, where we have to feed the decryption algorithm back to the evaluation algorithm. And this is also another behavior of what we call self-eating. Also, uh, the, you have the I.O. bootstrapping due to Gargatal in 2013, where to show that in order to get I.O. for poli circuits, you need to feed the evaluation and decryption of FHE back to some I.O. for a smaller class of circuits. So these two also do not fall under the, uh, the circuits with one-way function gates model. So inspired by this previous model that uh, uh, showed how to uh, uh, prove the limitations for circuits with one-way function gates model, we, propose, we extend this framework and propose our own model called the monolithic model, where we say we have a monolithic construction of I.O. from some primitive P. If this primitive P can accept circuits with any arbitrary P gates, that is including P1 or P gates, and it is not uh, constrained to only a specific type of gate, such as a one-way function gate. And this, for example, captures the FE to I.O. construction. It captures the, the bootstrapping theorems. And uh, this is where we're going to use this monolithic model to prove our separation results. So if I were to restate our result, instead of saying there's no black box construction, I will accurately say that there is no monolithic construction of I.O. from any of these uh, primitives. Great, so let's go over the second part, which is I'll talk about the high-level ideas behind the separation results. And uh, all, of our, uh, all of our results are based on proving an impossibility of, uh, of, of I.O. from some form of witness encryption. And so I'll be focusing on witness encryption for the rest of the talk. So let's say we want to prove that this kind of construction is impossible. Let's say we want to prove that a monolithic construction of I.O. from P is impossible. There is actually an equivalent way of looking at it. You can actually look at it as a fully black box construction of I.O. from what we call an extended P, where extended P is simply the primitive P where uh, uh, the P is allowed to accept circuits with any types of gates inside it. And this is different than, than proving an impossibility result. And it suffices to prove that fully black box construction of I.O. from extended P is impossible to show that monolithic constructions of I.O. from P is impossible. And this is different from showing an impossibility result of fully black box construction of I.O. from a normal P. The extended P is actually a stronger primitive. And we have to make sure that we define, we, we, we carefully define what it means to have this kind of extension for this kind of primitive. 
And so, the, uh, for, uh, in order to prove our possibility result, we're going to uh, rule out a fully black box construction of IO from this extended P. Great, so let's go over the general plan behind proving wh what it means uh, to, uh, to uh, rule out a construction of IO from P in a black box way. And this is the plan that, uh, of, of the general plan of how, we, how one does this. So the first step is we first define an idealized oracle that securely realizes uh, the primitive P. For example, in the case of uh, uh, the Canetti et al, where they show that IO cannot be based on one-way function in a black box way, they show they, they, the, their idealized model happens to be the random oracle. And the second step is that now that we have the idealized oracle, the second step is to compile out this uh, uh, idealized oracle from IO in the idealized model and get back an approximate IO in the plane model. And by approximate IO, we simply mean that it is correct on almost all inputs. Then we use the work, the third step is that we use the work of uh, Brekersky, Bruschka, and Fleischhacker uh, to, to conclude that from the, from the previous two steps, we find that there is no black box construction of IO from P. And we want to apply this plan for the case of proving that IO construct, that monolithic constructions of IO do not, uh, uh, from, from witness encryption does not exist. And I will only focus on the first two steps since this is where the main challenges of our work uh, appear. And uh, notice that in the first step where we need to define idealized oracle, we need to define idealized oracle that implements extended witness encryption because recall that a monolithic construction of IO from witness encryption is actually a fully black box construction of IO from extended witness encryption. So we need an oracle that implements extended witness encryption. So what is witness encryption, in case you're wondering? So witness encryption says that you can encrypt a message with respect to some circuit, let's call it F, and if we want to decrypt the circuit, I would only get back the message if the supplied witness is a satisfying statement to the circuit. If it is not a satisfying statement, I would get nothing. And when we want to define what extended witness encryption is, we basically mean that the function that we supply during encryption and evaluate during decryption only co can contain witness encryption gates, that is encryption and uh, decryption gates. So that is what we mean by extended witness encryption. And if we want to define such an oracle, it's quite uh, simple to define. We just simply uh, define it as a form of idealized encryption and decryption functionality where the encryption could happen, could, uh, happen to be, for example, uh, a normal random oracle. So given this oracle, our next step is to compile out this oracle from IO. Okay, let's see how, how one does this. We are starting with an extended witness encryption oracle in the IO, uh, and uh, I, we have an IO in this, in this uh, idealized oracle, and we want to end up with an IO in the plane model that does not ask any queries to the, uh, to the, to, to the oracle, but it is approximate. And the two main questions that we'd like to ask when we uh, compile out this IO is, how do we obfuscate in this new obfuscation, and how do we evaluate this new obfuscation? So the main, uh, the general idea behind the compilation process uh, was introduced by uh, Kanati, Kalai, and Panath in the context of uh, compiling out the random oracle from, uh, uh, from an uh, obfuscator in the random oracle model. And it consists of two steps. The first step being an emulation phase where I would run the ideal model obfuscation while emulating the queries that are asked by this ideal model obfuscation. I would emulate it consistently and I would get some output, some circuit as an obfuscation. The second step is the learning phase where I would run this uh, algorithm many times on different random inputs while still emulating the queries and answers uh, during the learning phase. The, the purpose of this phase is, that, is I would like to learn all the highly likely queries that, would, that might occur in the, in, in the evaluation. So I would run it many times, uh, answer the queries consistently, and the output of this obfuscation is the ideal model obfuscation along with the queries that were asked or learned uh, during the learning phase. 
the queries and the answers. And if I want to evaluate this new obfuscation on a new input, I would simply run, execute this ideal model obfuscation on this input while answering the queries uh, with respect to the queries and answer pairs that were learned uh, during the learning phase. So we added these queries that were asked during the learning phase in order to make sure that we answer them, we, we, we answer the queries during the evaluation phase consistently and correctly. And note that by adding them, we do not hurt security because these queries are learnable. That is, any, 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 any adversary in the ideal model could learn these queries on its own. So it's fine to include them in the output of the obfuscation. So what happens when we look at the compilation process, the same compilation process, when we look at it and we want to compile out the witness encryption or the extended witness encryption oracle? So the challenge that we face here is that during the learning phase, there might be uh, decryption queries that were asked, and these decryption queries might have hidden queries as a result of behind the scenes uh, queries that could be asked when evaluating F. Now recall that F, since we're dealing with extended witness encryption, F, the circuit, could have witness encryption gates. So due to, these, due to the existence of these hidden queries, we cannot add these hidden queries to the output of the obfuscation because they are not learnable and adding them will, will hurt security. However, not adding them would hurt the correctness of the scheme because then we wouldn't be, answer, we wouldn't be able to answer the queries of the final evaluation consistently. So how do we resolve this problem? Well, let's go and look back at the Oracle and we're going to modify our Oracle a bit by adding a subroutine called the reveal subroutine that takes as input as ciphertext and outputs the circuit, and that's it. And we note that adding this subroutine doesn't hurt the security of the witness encryption oracle. So now that we added this reveal subroutine, we could actually make use of it to uncover these hidden queries. How do we do that? During the learning phase, every time a decryption query is asked, we reveal the ciphertext that we want to decrypt, get back the function, and make B run the function itself. This forces the hidden queries to become discoverable. And once they are discoverable, they can also be learnable by any, any adversary in the ideal, in the ideal uh, model. And again, since they are learnable queries, they can be safely uh, inserted into the output of the obfuscation as well. And we can then evaluate the final, eva uh, eva evaluate the circuit consistently with respect to the uh, queries and answers that were learned during the learning phase. So that's how we solved it for the case of witness encryption. However, when we look at uh, predicate encryption, the challenge here is the same. We still have hidden queries because we, we're dealing with extended predicate encryption, and extended predicate encryption could have circuits with predicate encryption gates, and therefore there might be hidden queries behind the scenes. So how do we uncover these hidden queries? Well, we can't. We cannot have reveal subroutines as this would violate security. We cannot do it for all decryption for all decryption queries. So then what can we do? Well, the thing is, during learning, whenever we call a decryption, if the decryption happens to succeed, then we can uncover the hidden queries that were asked by this decryption. So we can only uncover, we can only do like partial discovery of the hidden queries, and we can only uncover these queries if the decryption succeeds. And we argue that we argue that this is sufficient, discovering like partial queries is sufficient to show that uh, the, consist the consistency of the evaluation holds and the correctness also holds. And so that's how we solved it for predicate encryption. And using the same argument, because of the zero one property, because of the all or nothing property uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the encryption schemes, we uh, leveraging this property allows us to discover the queries that were hidden by revealing the message that was encrypted. So that's how we, uh, that's, the, that's, how we uh, that's the high level idea of the proof. And as a summary, I'm going to state that here, basically the result where there's no, there's no monolithic construction of IO from any of these primitives. And um, so these are some future uh, work that we might be interested in. We could, for example, look at lower bounds for I.O. from stronger assumptions, say it's alternative 
or weaker forms of functional encryption, perhaps even from the learning with errors problem. We still don't know uh, whether this implies I.O. or not. And of course, we want to look at other applications of the monolithic model with respect to finding lower bounds for other primitives that have this kind of behavior, because this seems like a very useful model. So uh, yeah, thank you.